What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and if you're new here, welcome to my channel I hope you like low-budget movies because in today's video We're gonna be reviewing one this movie is special though because I've actually talked about the person who wrote and directed this movie Unfortunately, it's not Eli Socre even though a movie with Eli Socre in it would be f***ing Awful, I would love to see it. The movie was actually created by Stromedy and it's called Crated So I guess you could say he created the movie <laughs> So the movie came out this year in 2020 and you could actually watch it for free on his YouTube channel Or you could be an idiot like me and pay six dollars for it on his website. Thanks for that one Stromedy Please give me a refund. I beg I fucking beg anyways This movie is by far better than your average low-budget movie, but it is by no means a good movie the acting is Decent the pacing is way too fast the writing is okay But there are a few scenes where it's just flat-out weird and the twists in this movie are pointless. They're fucking pointless. Regardless, for this being his first movie with a small budget and a cast of rookie actors, I would say this movie is decent. Or at least it started out decent and then gets kind of shitty. It's kind of like a relationship, you know? It starts off great and amazing and then somewhere along the way it just turns to shit and you just want it to end. <sighs> yep. So the movie starts off with like a rock or a meteor or whatever floating through space and I'm not an astronaut So I'm not properly trained to identify objects floating through space But if I had to guess I would say it's an asteroid anyways This asteroid is just floating through space minding its own business completely and totally harmless Or is it then it cuts to our main character whose name is Alex And he is trapped in a crate hence the name crated pretty creative right? Or should I say, creative? Nope, that was fucking bad. So Alex is trapped inside a crate, and you'll notice that there are five other crates around him, but no one is in them. Yes. So he calls out for help, and when he gets no response, he goes immediately to plan B. And the B stands for beating the absolute shit out of that poor crate. He tackles it like a hundred times. He kicks the shit out of it. And just when you think he's done, he's, he sits down and he gives the wall a little tap. Just nothing too hard, just a little push. Gentle push. You know how walls are, sometimes they're like loose and you can just push a wall right open. That's what he was going for. It didn't work though, unfortunately. And since breaking through the crate clearly isn't working, he decides to stop physically assaulting the crate and just take a step back, you know, calm down, relax his muscles and brainstorm. He paces back and forth for a bit before taking a seat right next to his car keys and that's when it happens. He has a brain blast, but this brain blast is unlike any other brain blast you've ever seen before. Because the idea he comes up with is so fucking stupid that you'll be surprised that someone with a brain actually thought of this and decided, hey, let's put this in a movie. So his genius idea is that he's gonna use the car keys to rip out the screws. Now, if you guys know anything about screws, you'll know that screws aren't nails. They're screws. And they're not just hammered in like nails are. They're screwed in, which means they're basically impossible to just rip out with your bare hands, even with the help of your fucking car keys. And on top of that, the technique he's using would take him literal days to rip out a single screw. He's just gently tapping his keys on the wood without really using any force. Now the technique he's using may look familiar to you, and that's because it is. This is the same technique that water uses to break down rocks. Which takes millions of years. It's not very fast. It's not very efficient. But it gets the job done. Eventually. Next we get a time lapse showing us that Alex has been working basically all day, but probably only got like one or two screws out before he was interrupted by a strange sound that came from outside of his crate. He looks around for a bit until he finally sees what's making the sound. I think. Fun fact about me, 
I'm blind as shit, so I kind of just live my life squinting and barely being able to see anything. So in this scene, it's hard for me to tell if Stromney sees something and I can't see it because I'm fucking blind, or if there's actually just nothing there. But either way, whatever Alex saw really spooked him. So then it cuts to the next morning, where Alex is waking up from what was probably the worst sleep he's ever had in his life. At which point we get a random, super close-up shot of this ant. I don't know why this shot is in the movie, doesn't explain anything, I don't think it's symbolic of anything. Stromy just probably thought it was a, it was a cool shot. Look at that ant go just, just walking on his face, just uh, yeah. It's a good shot, I have to admit. After a few minutes of being awake, he notices food and water in the corner of his room. Who put it there? We don't know and neither does he, but he doesn't care because he just wants to eat it all. I guess Alex isn't familiar with the concept of rationing food because he doesn't know when he's gonna eat again. That could have been his food for the week and he just ate it in like, five minutes. And while he's wolfing down his food, he hears a helicopter in the distance. He tries his best to get the helicopter's attention. I got here! Help! Which obviously fails because it's like a thousand feet in the air and he's literally in a box with his arms sticking out. Like, it's clearly not gonna notice him. So he kicks his plate in frustration, causing it to break. Now he's got pieces of broken ceramic scattered all across his room, which is probably gonna make his sleep even more uncomfortable. However, seeing the helicopter must have reignited his will to live, because once he finishes peeing, he gets right back into escaping. And here's some food for thought. How's he pooping? He makes it very clear that he's peeing in the cup, but we never see a scene of him pooping. I imagine he just like shits in his hand and then throws it out of the crate, which is super gross, but it's just something to consider. So we see a nice montage of him using the keys to dig out the screws again. But after a while of doing this, he gets bored and decides to practice his calligraphy using a sharp blade of ceramic from the plate he broke earlier. Now I know you guys are probably thinking the same thing I am. Jeez, Alex, you're really good at calligraphy. Where did you learn such a skill? Just kidding, I actually don't care about his impressive calligraphy skills. What I'm actually wondering is how on earth did he manage to not cut himself on that shard of broken ceramic? Not only is ceramic really sharp, but look how tightly he's gripping it. He should be bleeding out right now. So he decides to take a break from his calligraphy when he hears absolutely nothing and decides to go check it out. I've played this clip back a few times, and there's just nothing, there's no sound. I don't know what he heard, but I didn't hear it. It is here where he discovers a horribly CGI'd butterfly. I don't know whose idea it was to put this in the movie, or why they even bothered doing it, but whoever did it should genuinely be ashamed of themselves, because it's really bad. He also notices a book on the ground. Who put it there? We don't know but Alex is determined to retrieve it. Now obviously the book is too far away to reach, so here's where Alex gets creative. He ties his shoelaces to his denim jacket to create a kind of net, and then he throws it at the book repeatedly until the denim snags the book securely enough so that he could reel it back in. Sounds impossible, right? That's because it is. Which is why they don't even bother showing him doing it. He throws his jacket and fails a few times, and then the camera goes to his face where he successfully throws the jacket and reels it in. When I first saw this, I assumed his denim jacket had magical properties, kind of like the coat that Doctor Strange wears, but unfortunately, that's not the case. It's just a normal denim jacket that occasionally defies the laws of physics. But all jokes aside, this is a really interesting part of the movie. We still don't know anything about who took Alex or why he's here, but this book offers us some really interesting clues about what's going on. The book contains pictures of six different people, one of them being Alex. So we can assume that these people are going to fill up the rest of the crates. Beside each picture is the person's name, age, sex, the number and letter that corresponds with their crate, and a positive trait they possess. For example, Alex is a 20 year old male, his crate is 1N, and the positive trait he possesses is leadership. So with all this information, we can infer that more people will be placed into these crates. These people were specifically selected based on a number of different factors to create a team of some sort. I think it's really cool that each character has their own little strength. Unfortunately, this idea is kind of forgotten as the movie progresses. In fact, later on in the movie, one of the characters who has self 
selflessness written down as their strength actually leave behind an injured person, which is like the exact opposite of selflessness. And this is just one of many examples where the character's actions don't really align with the strength they possess. But after studying the book for probably a long time, Alex falls asleep and wakes up next to a chainsaw. He uses the chainsaw to cut open the crate and escape into the night, leaving behind both his magical denim jacket and his phone. So he stumbles around in the woods for a while and then eventually comes across a car. Luckily for him, the car stops. So he gets in and then poof, he wakes up because it was actually all just a dream. That's right, who could have ever guessed that the people who kidnapped him didn't leave a chainsaw in his crate while he was sleeping. I honestly didn't see it coming. But I guess this dream made him realize just how low his chances of survival are because the next morning, he takes out his phone and records his final words. He talks about where he is, the absolutely ridiculous methods he used to try and escape, and he ends off the video with this. I want my family to know, if I have one, And I love them. The next night, while Alex is sleeping, we get a glimpse of a mysterious robed figure who looks to be putting somebody else inside the crate. The first time I saw this, I remember being decently excited and curious to see what happens next. Unfortunately, now that I've seen the movie a few times, I can safely say that this is when the movie starts to go downhill. Up until this point, Alex has been alone, so there hasn't really been any dialogue. But once characters start getting introduced, <sighs> shit gets weird. Shit gets really weird. So we get introduced to this character named Julia, and right away, Buzz Killington over here explains that there's absolutely no way she's gonna be able to escape the crate. There's gotta be a way out of this! There's no way, I already tried. Don't bother, it's not gonna work! I tried already, it's too strong! Now obviously she's gonna try for herself to see if she can escape, and after about 15 seconds, she just gives up and comes to the conclusion that she's gonna fucking die. We're gonna die in here, aren't we? Fun fact about this girl, the strength she possesses is intelligence, and so far she's not doing a very good job of displaying that. So they discuss the book and its contents for a few minutes, and this is where they realize that the other four crates will be filled with the other four people in the book. That means that there's still at least four more characters to be introduced in this movie. This is likely why the movie feels so rushed and the pacing is so fast. It starts off really, really slow, and then in the last 20 minutes, we're introduced to four new characters, and everything just happens so damn fast. In this next scene, Julia really proves to us just how unintelligent she is. Instead of doing anything remotely close to being productive, you know, like trying to figure out how to escape, or trying to figure out where they are or who took them, they spend the rest of the day just playing tic-tac-toe and engaging in some fucking cheesy-ass dialogue. I won! Yeah? I went easy on you. Oh, did you now? You know, it's not fair that you know what I look like, but I don't know what you look like. Uh, well, let's see. I have dark brown hair. I got green eyes. My name is Alex. And I currently look like shit from being in this crate so long. I don't know if it's just me, but it seems really weird to flirt with a guy you've never seen. Especially when he's been locked in a crate and hasn't showered for over three days. <clears throat> Unfortunately, their beautiful game of tic-tac-toe is ruined when they hear branches cracking in the distance. Julia gets up to see what made the noise and she spots one of the hooded figures that Alex saw earlier. I'm not quite sure how she's able to see it from so far considering it's pitch black outside and the hooded figures are wearing all black. My best guess is that she eats a lot of carrots or like has special contact, I don't know. There's no way she should be able to see that thing from so far away, but she does. They scream and shout at the figure, they ask it a bunch of questions, but for whatever reason, it doesn't even acknowledge their presence. The next day, Alex wakes up to a bunch of people screaming from within their crates. <gasps> That's right, the crates have all been filled, meaning we have four new characters to introduce with 
just under 25 minutes left in the movie. We have James, who possesses the trait of physical strength, Elise, who possesses the trait of selflessness, Brianna, who possesses willpower, and Jake, who possesses bravery. Knowing these characters' names is borderline pointless because they're so irrelevant and they all lack any personality whatsoever. But now you know him. So as everyone is yelling, Alex launches a water glass at a neighboring crate, creating a noise so loud that it gets everyone's attention. <laughs> Don't ask me how he was able to throw the glass so hard despite his arm barely being able to fit outside the crate. He probably just had some help from his magical denim jacket. So they get right into problem solving and Alex assures them that it is impossible to escape. There's absolutely nothing they can do. So you're telling me you've been trapped here for over a week? Yeah, I already tried to get out. It's impossible. Less than 30 seconds later, they come up with a pretty simple plan to escape. Only one of us needs to get out. A road can't be too far from here. Look, if somebody wants to try that, then go for it. But we can't all count on it. Hey, when do they give us food? I don't know. It must be sometime early morning. It's worth a try. Just make a run for it when they open the door. When the hooded figures go to bring someone food, that person is going to make a run for it. Pretty simple and obvious plan, right? Well, I can only imagine how embarrassed Alex must feel right now. This man's been trapped in a crate for over a week, and he couldn't come up with one good idea to escape. And these people were here for like four minutes, and they already came up with a plan that seems like it's going to work. So that same night, when the hooded figures go to feed Jake, he tackles one to the ground and makes a break for it. Again, I really want to emphasize how embarrassed Alex should feel. He's been trapped in this crate for over a week, and throughout this whole time, he didn't think to just stay up late, wait for the hooded figures to feed him, and just run away. You'd think that that'd be, like, one of the first things you'd do, but I guess he was so busy trying to dig out the screws that he didn't have any time to think of an actual plan that might work. As Jake is running through the forest, he's being pursued by multiple hooded figures. He trips on a small log, which I guess breaks his whole leg, because after that point, he's unable to walk, and inevitably, and inevitably, therefore he does end up getting caught. Once they catch him, they light his ass up. I don't know what they do. Well, I do know, but I'm not gonna spoil it. I would love to know what you guys think happened to Jake. Legit, because when I watched this initially, I was like, what What the fuck did they do to him? So if you guys have any theories, uh, let me know in the comments down below. I really would love to know what you guys think before I spoil the movie for you. So whatever happened to Jake, it made a loud noise that everybody heard. <laughs> which sparked an interesting debate between the rest of the group. We're all gonna die. You're not gonna die. They just killed one of us. Someone has to be next. Nobody's next, all right? He shouldn't have ran off on his own. What do you mean ran? What else was he supposed to do? You heard that correctly. Alex says that Jake deserved to die for running off on his own, even though just 10 minutes ago, all of them together agreed that that was the plan. If someone escapes, they run and try and get help to save everybody else. So this whole commotion has my girl Brianna convinced that they're all gonna die. So her genius idea is to simply starve to death. We're already dead. We might as well starve ourselves to death before they can use us for their sick game. You're already dead if you start thinking like that. Wake up! We're never leaving these crates. We're never getting out. Why can't you see that? Which is an awful idea, considering that starving to death is one of the most slow and painful ways you can die. Also, fun fact about Brianna, the special strength that she possesses is willpower. So it's very weird to me that the girl who's supposed to have a lot of willpower is recommending that everyone just starves to death. Shut up! Sorry about that. So it's kind of weird that the girl who possesses a lot of willpower is suggesting that everyone just starve to death and give up. It doesn't, it doesn't actually make any sense, but again, the writing isn't that great in this movie, so that's kind of why she's saying that. Towards the end of the argument, James says one of the cringiest lines in the movie. But I'm not giving up without a fight! The next time they come, I'm gonna give them a run for their money! 
His tone sounded pretty badass, but the line was just so lame. If he had said he's gonna fuck them up, or avenge Jake, or whoop some ass, it could have been really cool, but instead he just says, I'm gonna give them a run for their money! And it's very not cool. The next day, Alex is just chilling there, thinking of a way out, when he has the most obvious epiphany I've ever seen in my life. This guy has been chilling in his crate for over a week. He's been fed every single day. And only now is he realizing that the crate has a door attached to it. How did he think they were getting food to him? How did he think those other people were getting put in the crates? How did he think he got put in the crate? Like, I'm genuinely curious how he thought these robe figures were getting stuff into the crates, if not for a door. Anyways, he wakes up Julia because he needs her phone since his is dead. She throws him the phone, and you're probably thinking, how is he gonna actually retrieve the phone? Don't forget, he owns a magical denim jacket. So he straps that bitch on, and he throws it out and gets the phone. This time it's even more unbelievable, because a phone is way smaller than a book, but he does it, and at this point, I'm not even surprised by like any of the dumb shit that goes on. He uses the phone to see what kind of lock is attached to his door, which I'll admit is pretty clever. He discovers that it's a panel lock, and out of nowhere, Julia suggests that maybe the numbers in the crates have something to do with the code, which, uh, makes no fucking sense. Why would someone kidnap you, lock you in a crate, and then put the password to the locks right there in front of you to see? Unless, of course, the hooded figures wanted them to escape. So somehow, Julia was right, and the password was directly related to the numbers on their crates. And with that information, Julia and Alex unlock everyone's crates, and they plan their next move. So they head for the woods, and after running for a bit, Julia trips and falls over a log, or a root, or... Oh! No, I guess it was a fucking bear trap. That's weird. But honestly, there's no way that there was a bear trap there. She definitely just tripped over a log and cut her leg wide open. I don't know how, but I'm honestly over questioning the dumb shit that happens in this movie, so let's just go with it. So James, whose trait is just pure physical strength, offers to carry Elise, and they all escape to safety. It's how the movie should have gone, but this movie makes no fucking sense, so that didn't happen at all. Instead, James doesn't offer to pick her up. The girl who claims to be selfless doesn't offer to stay behind and keep her safe. They kind of just leave Alex and Julia there to get caught. Careful. We'll come, we'll come back! We'll go get help! I won't leave without you, alright? So obviously Alex and Julia get caught because they're sitting on a log, not moving. But the other three got caught as well, somehow. I honestly don't know how James got caught, and I don't know why he's not fighting back. He's got probably 80 pounds on these tiny, hooded people. He could beat the shit out of all of them. Probably easily, and not even sweat, but instead he just accepts defeat and, and just lets himself get captured? It's weird, I don't know. The hooded guys gather up the group, they point to the sky, and you would not believe what comes out of it. A fucking spaceship. Then it cuts to the asteroid heading towards Earth, and it's pretty safe to assume that that asteroid is gonna hit Earth. Unless that isn't Earth. And this is basically where the movie ends. The last scene is just an explanation, but since I'm such a nice guy, I figured I'd take the liberty of explaining the movie for you. So Jake is alive and the aliens told him everything. It wasn't actually Earth that was hit by an asteroid, it was Mars. Yep, these guys are Martians. But don't worry, we'll talk about why that twist is so stupid in a little bit. So the aliens knew that the asteroid was coming, but they simply had no time to evacuate Mars because their hands were full. They were way too busy kidnapping these seven random people and locking them in crates. Instead of spending literally seven days tracking down and kidnapping these people, they could have easily spent that time just gathering people and putting them on their ship, their big ass ship, and taking those people to where they are now. Which, big plot twist incoming, is Earth. They are now on Earth. The aliens have saved these seven people and place them on Earth to start fresh. It's like a Noah's Ark kind of vibe. And that's how the movie ends. Now, I had a ton of issues with this movie. The biggest one probably being that the twist at the end is so pointless. In my opinion, it would have been really cool if anything in the movie hinted that these people weren't from Earth. If they had like alien eyes or like a tail or even just slightly different phones. If Stromedy had done anything to hint that these people were from Mars and not Earth, it would have been a cool twist because you would have been like, oh, so that's why whatever happened earlier in the movie, you know, you would connect the dots. But there are no dots to be connected when you figure out the from Mars. You're just like, 
oh, I had no fucking idea. I also find it kind of weird that this advanced alien race is still writing in books, and they also write in English, so that kind of doesn't make any sense. And in general, the plot and the writing could use a little work. But like I said before, considering the small budget, the cast of rookie actors, and it being his first movie, I would say that the movie was decent. Or it started off decent and then got kind of bad. And I can honestly say that I'm excited for the next movie that he puts out. Now, if you guys enjoyed the video, please drop a like, leave a comment. If you guys know of any other low-budget movies you want me to review, let me know in the comments down below. And lastly, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. And until next time, got all these peace out. In my closet. Man, if you want it, I got it. I need to make a deposit. Ain't the most space in my pockets. I need my paper like Tom Nutt. 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 Let's get it.